Well, good morning, church. It is so good to see all of you, and uh, we are continuing to uh, wrap up a series that we've been in for the month of February titled More Than a Song. And uh, this morning, I'm going to be talking about how worship is more than a song, but the title of my message is Worship Through Music. Now, I know what you're thinking. That's an oxymoron. I know, right? It's an oxymoron. But, but worship is so much more than a song, but worship includes music, and it includes songs. And, and the truth is that I think there's many Christians that have boiled down this idea of worship just into music. And when you think worship, you instantly go to songs. But I don't want to re-preach the previous messages. If you've missed those, go back, listen to them. They're on our YouTube channel. But uh, we need to be in the mindset that when we come to church, that as we enter the foyer, as we enter the lobby, as we're driving in the, uh, the parking lot, that the way that we interact with those around us is worship. That when we lift our voice and we worship through song, that that is worship. We continue to worship in our giving. We continue to worship in serving. As, as the, the, um, the message has been preached and the word of God takes root in our heart and we are, we are transformed by the power of the Holy Spirit as we leave here, that is a form of worship. Everything that we do, everything that we say is worship. And we need to be in the mentality of it's worship through song. It's worship through giving. It's worship through serving. It's worship in preferring my neighbor in love. It's worship in being friendly in the parking lot and not driving like a crazy person. It's worship because he is worthy. But this morning we're zooming in and we're going to be looking at worship through music. Now I've always found it strange as to why worship through music has become such a big deal in the church. Why is it strange to me? Because only one time in the Gospels, which the Gospels are the books that record the life and the ministry of Jesus Christ, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and you see all of his ministry while he's on earth, only one time in the Gospels does it record Jesus and his disciples singing songs of praise and hymns. Yet for many, many years and decades, music has been this point of disagreement in the church. Now, when I say church, I don't necessarily mean our church, I mean the capital C church, just the church in general, the church of America, the church of the world. I truly believe that this church, and I want you to hear me, I truly believe that this church does a great job of living in the tension. What do I mean by living in the tension? Because this church is full of a a wide variety of age and upbringings and backgrounds and demographics, that brings with it a wide variety of opinions of what songs we should sing and how we should sing those songs. And guess what? That creates tension. And guess what? I'm okay with the tension. This church has, has several families where we've got great-grandchildren all the way to great-grandparents. Raise your hand if you're one of those families, right? Raise it high. Come on. Let's see it. Let's see it. There's a lot. You look around. There's a lot. And, and because of that tension, we can worship together. Um, on Sunday nights, I, I, I think this is a beautiful example of our kids come in and they worship with us and then we dismiss them for their uh, their. their uh, not activities, but their sermon and, and their kids' kids' time. And I look over and I see my kids, and when they're singing a song like, I thank God, you know, because he picked me up, he turned me around, he placed my feet on solid ground. I see my kids, you know, doing the actions, and they're singing a little extra loud with that newer song. But then when uh, the song In the Presence of Jehovah comes on, oh, all of a sudden my dad just comes to life. You know what? And, and guess what? I sing loud with both of them because I love both of them. But that tension is actually what keeps us together. And so I praise God for that this morning. Just by a show of hands, how many would say you prefer vanilla ice cream over chocolate ice cream? Okay, my hand's up. How many would say that you prefer chocolate ice cream over vanilla? It's about 50-50 here, right? But um, while I prefer vanilla... How many can just agree with me that just ice cream's good in general and you're not gonna turn down a bowl of ice cream, right? Why? Because ice cream is good, unless it's sugar-free, and then it's not quite as good. You know, it's better than no ice cream, but it's just not quite as 
as good. In the same way that we might have preferences about worship being traditional or blended or contemporary, can we just focus on Jesus this morning and not worry so much about the flavor? He is worthy of our praise. He is worthy because he is king and he has done a great work for us. Our main text will be in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. So you can turn there, and we're going to get there in a bit. But before we do, I just want to spend a little time talking about the purpose of music within the church. First, Scripture is very clear that we are to worship through song and through music. Psalm 95 says this. Come and let us sing for joy to the Lord. Let us shout aloud to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before him with thanksgiving and extol him, glorify, magnify him with music and song. For the Lord is great, is the great God, the great king above all gods. In Psalm 117, it says this, Praise the Lord, all you nations. Extol him, all you peoples. For great is his love towards us, and the faithfulness of the Lord endures forever. Praise the Lord. In Colossians chapter 3 says this, Let the message of Christ dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all the wisdom through psalms and hymns and songs from the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in your heart. And whatever you do, this is the worship, right? More than a song. Whatever you do, whether in word or in deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. When we worship in church through music, we are aligning ourselves with the written word of God. When, when we lift our voice, when we lift our hands, we are following the written word, the written will, the Bible, God's holy word, and it is aligning with our lives and with our hearts. Now, one great benefit of worshiping through music is that music is an effective way to learn and retain and remember information. Now, I've got three uh, young children, Sam, nine, Paisley, seven, SE5, and I'll just brag on them. They are the best children in the world 70% of the time, okay? The other 30% of the time, they're just Elizabeth's kids, okay? <laughs> but uh, in, in primary el- or education, you know, in elementary, what, what do they use as a tool to teach things? Song, right? You've got rhyme, you've got rhythm, you've got repetition, and this is how we are teaching our kids. If I were to say, tell me the alphabet, what do you do? A, B, C, D, E, F, G. I can't hardly think of the alphabet without singing it in my head. Anybody else there? Right? How many learned the 50 states of the, or the 50 states of the United States by song? Anybody remember that? An element, some people, the nifty 50, you know, Alabama, Alaska, Arizona, Arkansas. Lori's singing along with me, right? Okay? You, you learn through song. Um, the days of the week. That's how my kids learn what day of the week. There's Sunday and there's Monday. There's Tuesday and there's Wednesday. There's Thursday and there's Friday. And then there's Saturday, days of the week. Right? <laughs> Mary Beth Helmick, you are giving me a look that is just stranger than anything right now. Yes, my kids learn the days of the week to song. My sister... When she sets the table once a year at Thanksgiving, okay, <laughs> I'll rat you out, Taylor, um, she, she sings a song from a play, Dear Edwina Jr., uh, Knife, Fork, Spoon, and, and I'm not going to sing it for you, uh, but, but the books of the Bible, anybody learn the books of the Bible through song, right? My youngest, Essie, when she was uh, about two weeks from turning four years old, she, she went to Pastor Courtney, and you get a t-shirt if you can recite all the books of the Bible, and she recited them two weeks before she turned four years old, through song. By worshiping uh, with song and, and singing with song, it's helping us remember the truths of God and who he is. Science shows that music activates both the left and the right brain at the same time, and the activation of both hemispheres can maximize learning and improve memory. Music helps us remember truths about God, you're saying, I don't know if I believe you. How about this? And when I think that God, his son not sparing, sent him to die, I scarce can take it in. That on the cross, my burden gladly bearing, he bled and died to take away my sin. 
For all my life you have been faithful. All my life you have been so, so good. Or how about, how about this one? In the darkness we were waiting, without hope and without light, till from heaven you came running, there was mercy in your eyes to fulfill the law and prophets. To a virgin came the word, speaking of Jesus, from a throne of endless glory to a cradle in the dirt. You didn't want heaven without us. So Jesus, you brought heaven down. My sin was great. Your love was greater. And what could separate us now? He took my sins and my sorrows and he made them his very own. And he bore my burden to Calvary and he suffered and died alone. I'm not going to sing to you all. I know you put you guys all to sleep <laughs> this morning. But man, there is power in music and it helps us remember the truths of God through rhyme, through rhythm, through repetition. Another purpose of music that serves us is, is that it ministers to our emotions and to our souls. There have been numerous studies showing how music affects our emotions. In fact, one study showed that listening to music releases dopamine in the brain with our dopamine levels increasing by up to 9% when it's music that we enjoy. Anybody ever been in a bad mood? You throw on some good music and then, ah, I'm in a good mood now, right? And similar to fragrances, there are just certain songs, certain genres of music that just take me back. I grew up and I cut my teeth with my dad in, in uh, his, his Plymouth Grand Caravan green 1998 van, right? And we grew up on 93.3 KIOA, the oldies, back when it really was oldies and now it's kind of not really oldies. And so whenever I hear a Beatles song, eight days a week, I love you. Yeah, I, I just go back to when I was 10 or 11 or 12 years old, cruising around thinking I'm cool in a green minivan with my dad. <laughs> and it just takes me back. When I hear Frank Sinatra's, I've got the world on a string and I'm sitting on a rainbow. I've got the world on my finger, right? That takes me back to the night that I asked Elizabeth to be my wife. I played that song for her, and I got down on one knee, and I asked, and she said no, and I asked again, she said, no, I'm seasoned, she said yes. <laughs> <laughs> when I hear some of the older worship choruses, as the deer panteth forth, the water, oh, my soul longeth after thee, or God is good all the time. He put a song of praise in this heart of mine. You guys remember that one? Oh, yeah. And then there's other people who are like, oh, no. Tension, right? Tension. I like that. Man, I don't fully understand the way that we are wired, but I do know that music is connected with our emotions and with our feelings. I think that's why a lot of people really love the time of worship. You might be sitting here and you're like, well, I, I don't. Well, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but there are a lot because music and song is connected with our emotions. It's important that we really feel God, and, and, but, and we need that. But our faith is built on more than just what we feel. We need our emotions and our logic to align and to become balanced. Now, I could spend more time talking about the benefits of music and give more reasons why we, we worship through song. But really, the only reason that matters is that Jesus is worthy. That's why we worship, through song, is that Jesus is worthy. Jesus, who is alive today, the Son of God, sitting on the right hand of the throne of God, interceding on our behalf, still performing miracles on our behalf, still saving, still healing. That Jesus is, right, the third person, present tense, singular, of the word be. It's, it's the state of being. Jesus is worthy, a person of imminent worth, of, of position, 
who is worth our attention, our, our interest, our work, our trouble, our love, our praise. Jesus is worthy. You say, well, why is he worthy? Well, I hope you're still in 2 Corinthians 5. Scripture is very clear as to why he's worthy, why we should even have a response such as clapping our hands, lifting our hands, lifting our voices, celebrating all the things he's done. And I just want to read with you verse 14. Since we believe that Christ died for all, we also believe that we have all died to our old life. He died for everyone so that those who receive his new life will no longer live for themselves. Instead, they will live for Christ who died and was raised for them. You know, I find it odd that the world is all about inclusive language, yet they reject the gospel of Jesus Christ. What does it say in verse 14? That Christ died for all. And in verse 15, he died for everyone. This is the gospel, that Jesus died For you, for me, for white people, for black people, for rich people, for poor people, for people that are searching for their identity, for Muslims, for educated, for uneducated, for all people. This is the gospel that God so loved the world that he sent his one and only son that whoever, that all who would call on his name would be saved. This is why Jesus is worthy because he is the one who has made a way. It's for everybody. Continuing on verse 16, I'm sorry I get so worked up. It's just really exciting to me. So we have stopped evaluating others from a human point of view. At one time we thought of Christ merely from a human point of view. How differently we know him now. Thank God that we don't just know Christ as a human, but we have an intimacy, right? There, there's, there's a spirit that connects us together with him. Verse 17, this means that anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. The old life is gone and a new life has begun. If you've received new life this morning, just give me a little wave. If you've received new life this morning, say yeah. Say oh yeah. Man, I'm so thankful that the new life has begun. It's now, it's here on earth, this new life. And if you don't have that new life today, I'm gonna give you an opportunity to step into that, to find, what out, find out what life of abundance is in Jesus Christ. Verse 18 says, and all of this, and all of this is a gift from God who brought us back to himself through Christ. And God has given us this task of reconciling people to him. What is reconcile? To to fix something that's broken, right? To, To bring people together that are opposing. Scripture says that while we were enemies, Christ died for us. It means that we were in opposition, we we weren't in relationship, and Christ has reconciled, he has brought us together. Verse 19, for God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. Here it is. No longer counting people's sins against them. And he gave us this wonderful message, this wonderful message of reconciliation. All of this, all of this is from God. All of what? Salvation, new life. Forgiveness, reconciliation, a clean slate, transformation of your heart, transformation of your mind, peace, joy, hope, strength, all of this is from God. It is not of yourself. It's not from the do-it-yourself dummy book. It, It is from God. God is the only one that can give you this new life, that can put in a peace when everything else around you is is coming down, that you've got a peace. It's all from Christ. And guess what? It is a gift. Woo, puberty. A gift. (laughs) That means you you can't earn it and you can't buy it. It is something that is given to you. Some of you need to be set free from the shackles of religion. 
where it's like, I just feel like I have to do something for God. I just feel like I, 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 I just need to earn this from him. No, hear me, it is a gift. God has paid that price and he's willing to give it to you. He is willing to give it to you. Your debt has been paid. Colossians 2, as the musicians come, Colossians 2 says this, he, being Jesus, canceled the record of the charges against us. It, and, and he took it away by nailing it to the cross. What a beautiful picture of that. I, I just, I think of this, like, here's your charges, you know, and then Jesus is like, give me that. Boom, 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 it is finished. He, Jesus, canceled the record of the charges. In one version it says, he canceled our, the, the record of our legal indebtedness against us, and he took it away by nailing it to the cross. And in this way, he, Jesus, disarmed the spiritual rulers and authorities. And he, Jesus, pu- uh, shamed them publicly by his victory over them on the cross. It is because of Jesus Christ that you are alive. Whether you've accepted him or not, it is his breath in your lungs. You just maybe haven't come to realize that. Because in him and through him and for him, all things have been made. He's the creator of everything. He gives you breath. It is because of Christ that we are alive. It is because of Christ that we are forgiven. Now, some of you are sitting here in in this weird place right now, and you're saying, Austin, that's good preaching. I believe everything that you say. I believe that Jesus died on the cross. I believe that he was raised to life three days later. I believe that he has forgiven me. But you're really quick to add this. But I just can't forgive myself. I, I believe that Jesus, that he died on the cross for me and, and that he has forgiven me. But, but, but I just can't forgive myself. Can we just do a little investigation on on this handcrafted lie from Satan? Because that's what it is, it's a lie from Satan. I just can't forgive myself. You never were in a position to forgive yourself. See, when you were standing convicted, guilty, in your, your sin and in your shame, not being in a place of being able to do anything about it, God, sent his son to do what only he could do, the perfect lamb of God, the perfect sacrifice to pay the penalty of our sins. And he did what only he could do. So we don't need to worry about, oh, I can't forgive myself because guess what? You couldn't, you can't, only Jesus can. You say, well, you you just don't understand. I just can't let myself off, off the hook. I've got to live with this stigma. I just, I just need to do something to make it up to God. Can I just humbly and gently suggest to you this morning that you need to submit yourself under the work of the cross of Jesus Christ and say the most powerful words of praise that a person can ever say say, I agree with God. I agree with God. And if he says that I'm a loved daughter, then I am a loved daughter. And if he says that I am forgiven and I am free, then I am forgiven and I am free. And if he says that his son took my sin and he bore my guilt and he bore my shame, then I say I'm no longer going to carry something that's already been bore by his son. And if if he says that I can move forward, then I say that I can move forward because I agree with God. That's what faith is. That's what faith is. It's agreeing with God. It's saying I'm going to stop agreeing with me and I'm going to start agreeing with God. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 says, it is by grace that you have been saved through faith. This is not of yourselves, but it is a, it's a gift of God, not by works so that no one can boast. Faith says, I agree with that. And if I agree with that, 
if you agree with that. If we all agree with that, then the only conceivable, proper response that I can come up with to this radical grace, to this unconditional love, to this amazing act that God has given us, the only proper response is extravagant worship. And not just through song, but through the way that we live our lives. Why do we clap? Why do we lift our hands? Why do we jump for joy? Why do we sing? Why do we sing a little louder? Why do we sing a little louder? Because Jesus is worthy. Have you lost sight of the cross this morning? Have you lost sight of all that Jesus has done for you? It's not because of your good works. God doesn't need your bank account. He needs your heart. He doesn't need your service and all of these things that you're sacrificing. He wants you. I agree with God. And if he says that it's by grace and it's a gift, then I say it's by grace and it's by gift. And part of agreeing with God is saying, God, if you say that this is the best way to live my life, I agree with you. Would you stand to your feet? Bow your heads, close your eyes. If you need to agree with God this morning and accept his gift of salvation, you need to be forgiven and you admit that, that you are in the wrong, that you'd admit that you can't save yourself right now, you admit that you're in need of a savior, would you just raise your hand with every eye closed and head bowed? I wanna lead you in a, in a prayer where you can receive salvation. You'd say, yes, there's one in the back. Is there anyone else? Yes, yes. You're saying, I agree with God. I'm forgiven, I'm chosen. I'm made new. Yes, I see you here. Is there anyone else? Say, I agree with God. I'm gonna stop striving. I, I receive your gift this morning. If you raise your hand, would you just repeat this in your heart? Jesus, would you come into my heart? I'm sorry, Lord. Would you forgive me of my sins? Would you change my mind? Would you change my thinking? Would you change my desires, God? Open my eyes that I might see you. Help me love you. I trust that your way is best. Help me, God, to walk in your ways. Help me, God, to, to, to begin to live for you and the things that money can't buy and death can't take away, things of eternity. So, God, I'm calling on you this morning to save me, to fill me, to use me. I give myself to you as you have given everything, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. If you prayed that prayer, I want to meet with you down in the altar in just a moment. But we are going to respond to Jesus. Why? Because he is worthy. He is worthy. Let's sing this together.